Ryan Fitterman uh, with Splunk. Thanks very much for joining us on My Security TV. It's great to be here in Boston for Conf25 uh, with Splunk. Um, Ryan, we've just had a session uh, with a panel. Uh, you were just talking about polymorphic uh, focused ransomware uh, mm -hmm. and also APT28 uh, that was recently reported. Uh, around Ukraine, I thought at least capture you and get your recent thoughts. Uh, your ex-Mitre as well. Uh, we're about 12 months out from uh, Cisco's uh, acquisition of Splunk, so there's been some changes. You're now with uh, Foundation AI in terms of your research. That's right. Maybe introduce us to your current role and your sort of research focus, and then we'll move into what uh, your recent observations are, particularly the last month or so, right? Sure. So yeah, I'm a senior manager on the Surge security research team. We're part of Foundation AI at Cisco. What we do at Foundation AI is uh, we train domain specific models for applying large language models to security problems. We also focus on strategic sec security research. We focus on the current challenges of the blue team. And a lot of that has naturally been steered towards the use and preparation for uh, attacks using AI. Um, so yeah, I've been here about three years uh, with Surge. Prior to that, I was at MITRE, part of the attack team. And what I was talking about today uh, was kind of the, the progression of attacks using AI. So what we've typically said is not to overreact to AI use from attackers because what they had been doing was really recreating a lot of the steps that they would traditionally use in an attack. So really using models as kind of like co-pilots assistance for conducting cyber attacks, but not actually creating novel capability. And what I think is interesting in just the past month or so is that the lines have started to blur there a little bit. There was a couple incidents that you mentioned um, the first was, I think the first AI enabled malware was an incident or a malware called LameHug, um, coined by CERT in Ukraine and attributed to APT28. This was really the first malware that I'd seen that integrated interactions with a large language model. And the way that it did that was that the model didn't contain specific commands for how it would interact on a machine, but it contained prompts and the prompts were reaching out to the Hugging Face API for the Quen coder model with a prompt to say, based on the attributes I've collected from the system, respond to me with the commands that are appropriate in this context for collecting data, um, kind of enumerating this kind of network environment. So we've had this ability to kind of be dynamic and respond to uh, what is being collected from the environment in real time, <clears throat> which previously uh, would have been more difficult if you tried to have a human in the loop kind of negotiating those kind of interactions. Would it have been trained to do that or asked to do that in that way, the methodology it used, or is it potential that it's uh, been a sort of a, a broad scope of find a vulnerability and it's done it in itself? Uh, is this an agentic AI model? No, not in this case. Um, the Quen coder model, I think, is just a, like a, a Chinese origin coding model um, that's open weight, open source, hosted on Hugging Face so that they could reach the API, just a generally trained model. Right. Um, but these models do have good understanding of, for example, how to run discovery commands on a Mac OS host versus a Windows host versus a Linux host. And that's really what they're tapping into here. So no need for fine tuning. And I think that's the other threat here is that it can go across different operating systems as well. It's not sort of refined uh, to any particular scope, right? Yeah, and that's similar to um, what was in the prompt lock example so that uh, the malware itself wasn't going in with specific instructions on how to deploy the ransomware. It was going in and doing more of a targeted specific data collection for the environment, and then it was writing kind of lightweight scripts on the fly to apply to the specifics of the environment and the files that they wanted to target. And that, again, is not uh, totally new from like a technique perspective, but it does feel like we're starting to get kind of a refinement on the way that attackers are thinking about operating. And does that uh, sort of... Uh suit any particular environments, particularly from a corporate perspective uh, yeah, or in industry perspective, 
or is it if once that's out in the wild? And the question is, is it out in the wild now? Um, but yeah, does it suit any particular environment? Uh, is there a message out to, to industry as to, to things to be aware of? Um, so this isn't out in the wild per se. Uh, the malware that was seen was observed by ESET researchers and there was a little, a little bit of an alarm, but then it was disclosed that this was a proof of concept by research students that tried to go to great extents to make sure that it wouldn't operate outside of their lab conditions. But it is the kind of thing we could expect to potentially see from operators in the future. Uh, I do think it's interesting and potentially dangerous in like an ICS type of situation because these environments are typically very bespoke. Um, you'll have different layers of um, management software, OT software, controllers and things that are speaking different custom protocols per the environment. And whereas in the past an attacker may have had to do a separate operation for reconnaissance in an environment like that to understand what kind of protocols, what kind of PLCs and things should be targeted, if they can do more of that on the fly by kind of having this uh, like malware based agent go in, kind of fingerprint the environment, if the model had the uh, expertise to write scripts or interact with the protocols in that environment on the fly, then you could have uh, like a collapsing of what would be like a multi-stage operation into just a single targeted exploitation. Uh, we talked about Argentic AI attacking Argentic AI and then they re almost like a counter countermeasure. Mm -hmm. Is that something that can eventually uh, sort of equate within these models uh, where it sort of understands and, and can adapt uh, in real time? I think it remains to be seen. There, there's been a lot of research in the past about like blue versus red bots yeah. and how they would perform against each other. I think one interesting case is the like weaponization or the development of models for discovering exploits. So there's been a lot of um, press about this recently that they've been training, fine tuning models to specifically find vulnerabilities in code. And you can imagine how that can be used uh, aggressively for attackers to find zero days, for example, in a publicly facing system, or it could uh, equivalently be used by defenders to try to proactively refine their code or like not be pushing things into production that are vulnerable. And it's really anyone's guess, I think, how that turns out, which, which side of that is more effective or who has better control over uh, a capability like that. Uh, there's been a number of announcements coming out this week uh, at Conf25, particularly around the Cisco data fabric and the use of uh, Splunk data. Um, these models are obviously, they, there's still that sort of counter argument that uh, AI is now going to make our systems more secure. Uh, is that something you're observing on this side as well, they, that the AI, um, the, the counter AI will need to be much more creative in order to get through uh, what's being applied now, like we're seeing this week? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've said before that I think that on defense, there's a lot more surface area for application of AI because there are so many human language data centric tasks just naturally occurring in the SOC from everything like um, bringing in CTI reports, generating summaries, producing threat intel reports, doing log analysis. All these things are aligned well with the strengths of language models. Um, I do think that there's a lot of promise to uh, be gained still from developing specialized AI agents for tasks within the SOC. So if we think about a job as kind of an aggregate of specific tasks, that's where I think we can train very specific smaller models and potentially have multiple security domain focused models handling lower level tasks. And that's where we'll free up a lot of analyst time and give them a lot of capabilities. So if we look at where um, there's been a lot of progression, a lot of improvement on the baseline for models. It's been in the performance of doing things like writing code. Uh, and that is because this is essentially like a verifiable domain that there's a, a definitive like correct and incorrect way to do a lot of things in software engineering. And I think that suggests that there would be a lot of really technical disciplines within the SOC that could benefit from that similar kind of fine tuning. So 
If we look at something like malware reverse engineering or code interpretability, there are definitive meanings behind that code. And if we can distill all of that knowledge into a language model that can provide that expertise to the SOC, that replaces or alleviates the need of having that really kind of high level skill set in what would previously be maybe a really senior SOC person if we have a model that can now definitively tell you what this byte pattern means, that raises the, the floor for everyone on your, your SOC watch floor. Yeah, it's definitely a cost to time and also better decision making, as you say. Uh, well, Ryan Fetterman, thank you so much for taking the opportunity to talk to us. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, great to have you on My Security TV uh, and talking about what was, what was termed a, a poly, poly, polymorphic uh, enabled ransomware, which, which, which was a, a term coined uh, today. But thank you for joining us on My Security TV. Thanks. Thanks for having me.